let's go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for thank you for joining us. As you uh, some may quickly realize, we have a uh, few more guests than was originally expected. Uh, we find something positive for once in a change due to the coronavirus, but I think we are, we will be better for it this evening. Um, the original discussion we were going to have was with Mr. Von Stakowski from the Heritage Foundation, but we are kindly joined by Congressman Puto Penseco and the UT Federalist Society student chapter. So for those of you where this is your first event, um, I, I, I would like to welcome you for coming and to note that the Federalist Society is a national organization of approximately 40,000 lawyers, law students, and other individuals who are interested in the current state of the legal order. While the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy questions, it is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. And today I want to emphasize that any positions taken on specific legal or political issues are those of the speakers and do not reflect an organizational stance. Today we are fortunate to hear from, as I mentioned, Hans von Tukowski from the Heritage Foundation and from Congressman Pico Canseco. I, I can think of a, an event no more timely than this. I mean, we stand on the precipice of an election that has ramifications that I could spend all night discussing, but what has been notably in the psyche is the, the integrity of the elections and the issues that can come up for mail-in ballots. And we are fortunate to have two experts that can discuss this at length. And I will go ahead and, and introduce Mr. Von Spikowski before turning it over to Seth, who will introduce the congressman. Um, I'm sure that for those of you that this is not your first event, Mr. Von Spikowski is someone who you are already familiar with. He speaks extensively on many national outlets as he has the senior legal fellow and manager of the Election Reform Institute at the Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He's an authority on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, elections, the First Amendment, immigration, and rule of law. He's a former member of President Donald Trump's Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. From 2006 to 2007, he was a member of the Federal Election Commission. He served as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice from 2002 to 2005. And prior to entering public service, he worked in 17 worked for 17 years as a government affairs consultant in the corporate legal department and in private practice. And he will probably indicate at some point that on this particular issue, he got his start just outside of Atlanta as a local election commissioner. So he's seen election law from a very wide swath. So uh, thank you for joining us this evening, Mr. Von Spikowski. Um, and with that, I, I would turn it over to Seth um, to introduce the Congressman. And I, I, I apologize. I, I note that this event is co-sponsored by the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And we'll have an opportunity to say a few words about that here shortly. Seth, thank you, here. Anthony. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing Congressman Francisco Kiko Canseco. Um, he is the director of the Election Protection Project at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. As Anthony just mentioned, they are co-sponsor tonight, and we thank them for that. He formerly represented the 23rd District of Texas in the United States Congress, where he served on the House Financial Services Committee and authored legislation for a constitutional economy, promoting border security, and challenging EPA overreach. As a graduate of the St. Louis University School of Law, supplemented by law studies at the University of Paris, he has more than 45 years of experience in law, banking, finance, real estate, and energy. We have a, a pair of experts with us tonight. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to be joined by them both. And I think that we will begin the evening uh, with about 10 to 15 minutes of remarks um, from each, uh, followed by about a 30 minute question and answer session. So that's the plan. And if I recall, Anthony, um, we were gonna defer to Hans to speak first. Yeah, give me a second on that. So to, to what Seth mentioned, I, I want everybody to, to know if, if you're not familiar with how the Zoom uh, webinars function, the Q&A is open at any time. If you have a question now, you could present it. So the at any point, if you feel like you have something you would like to present to either of our panelists, um, please feel free and, and include it. And we will go back and forth with what we have at the end of the discussion that Seth mentioned with each panelist. We'll go somewhere around 10 to 15 minutes each. We'll have a back and forth. We'll open the Q&A and, and that should wrap the event. Um, Mr. Von Spakovsky uh, won the coin toss and is elected to receive. He's going to go first. Uh, and with that, on the floor is yours, sir. 
Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the invitation to speak to everyone tonight. I'm sorry we're not uh, together in person uh, for that, but uh, I also appreciate uh, both chapters of the Federalist Society and the uh, Texas P Public Policy Institute work, working uh, to combine uh, these meetings so we can talk about this important issue. Um, you know, we were asked to discuss election integrity and uh, its implications for the election that we're about to have. And uh, unfortunately, uh, talking about uh, election fraud, which if you read the New York Times or the Washington Post, uh, you would think doesn't exist in America. Unfortunately, uh, it's too easy to talk about that in Texas because Texas has uh, a long history of voter fraud. Uh, not, not too many years ago, there was a very interesting article written by a researcher about all of the voter fraud that occurred in the state of Texas in the late 1800s. In fact, there were so many federal prosecutions going on that the Texas legislature uh, set up a system to divide the ballot because the only way federal prosecutors could come in was if there was a federal candidate on the ballot. So they set up a system of a federal ballot and you would go to one side of a polling place and vote the federal ballot. And then you would go to the other side of the polling place and only vote for state candidates. And what this researcher did is compared the numbers in the federal elections and the choices of voters with the numbers in the state elections and it found that there was apparently huge, a huge amount of ballot stuffing going on and fraud in elections there. Uh, Texas unfortunately also has the uh, dishonor of uh, the fact that uh, one of its U.S. senators, who of course became president, Lyndon B. Johnson, stole his first election. That's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. In fact, Box 13 is infamous. Uh, if, if, again, if you doubt it, just Google Box 13 and Lyndon B. Johnson, and you'll find that all of the individuals who helped stuff the ballot box with fake ballots to make sure he won his election all admitted uh, what they had done uh, later, later uh, uh, towards the end of their lives. Um, we have an election fraud database at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we started this just a couple of years ago, and we've got almost 1,300 proven cases of fraud in that database. Uh, it's only a sampling of cases. We have literally dozens and dozens and dozens of cases from Florida. There was a recent article about uh, arrests that have just occurred in Texas. Uh, four individuals charged with absentee ballot fraud in Gregg County, uh, including a county commissioner. Apparently it was a conspiracy to make sure the county commissioner got reelected in a election. Uh, she won by only five votes. Uh, a, uh, a Democratic mayoral candidate in Carrollton, Texas was just arrested again for absentee ballot fraud. He apparently was uh, registering voters uh, without their knowledge or consent and then requesting ballots also without their knowledge and consent so he could vote the ballot. Uh, all of this goes to show that while election fraud may not be a massive problem, which is what the left uh, now says or, or says these days, it's enough of a concern that we should take steps to try to deter it and find it when it happens. And it could make the difference in a close election. And that of course is the key. Uh, the US Supreme Court said that in 2008 when it upheld Indiana's voter ID law, it said exactly that, that the US has a long history of uh, election fraud. It's been documented by journalists and historians and it could make the difference in a close election. And look, we have close elections all the time in this country. Uh, look at, you can look at town council races, county commission races, state legislative races, uh, and they are often decided by just a very small number of votes. Uh, only two years ago, we had a congressional race overturned in North Carolina, the ninth congressional district race. That race was won by 905 votes, but then was overturned by the state board of elections after an intensive, uh, very wide investigation that discovered that there had been uh, uh, absentee ballot fraud organized by a political consultant and six of his staffers, all of them have been criminally charged and the election was overturned and a new election was held. Um, one of the problems with absentee ballots 
And you will find, if you look at our database, which is available on the heritage.org website, is that many of the cases involve absentee ballot fraud. Uh, there's a reason for that. They're the only kind of ballots that are cast outside the supervision of election officials and outside the observation of poll watchers, which destroys the transparency of the election process, which is a fundamental requirement uh, for the kind of elections that we have in this country. Um, the other problem with the absentee balloting process is that it makes voters subject to coercion and pressure. And again, if you think that doesn't happen, if you look at our database or you just do a quick uh, news search in Texas, you will find that in fact, particularly along uh, the Southern border counties, there's even a special name for the individuals who are paid by political campaigns, uh, they're called uh, politiqueros, who go to basically pressure people in their homes to vote a particular way, or frankly, to fill out their ballots for them. So there's coercion and pressure going on and individuals have been already prosecuted for that in Texas. So this is a real concern, uh, one we should all be worried about, particularly when it comes to absentee ballot. There's a second issue though too. I mean, I've been talking about intentional, intentional fraud uh, with the absentee balloting process. But the other big problem, and this is why all of the political leaders, candidates and others, election officials too, who've been urging people because of COVID-19 to vote using the absentee balloting process or making a big mistake. Look, no one doubts that we, should, we need to have absentee ballots. In particular, we need them for people who are too sick or physically disabled uh, to vote in person or could be out of town on election day. Uh, no one disputes that. And also no one disputes that in this election, those individuals who are most susceptible uh, with health issues to COVID-19 probably should vote by mail. But the vast majority of us, uh, of us have the ability to vote safely in person. We know that. Because in fact, uh, elections have been held during this pandemic with people voting in person and during other pandemics. To just give you two quick examples of this, um, South Korea held national elections on April 15th. 29 million South Koreans voted in person. The South Koreans did what other states have done and what health care experts have all recommended. They put in the same kind of safety protocol into the polling places that we all see when we go to our grocery stores uh, or our pharmacies these days. Uh, line spacing for voters waiting to vote, uh, people wearing masks, sanitation stations inside and out. In Wisconsin, uh, which held its primary uh, April 7th, election officials were required to clean every voting booth before a voter went in and after a, a voter came out. And they used disposable materials, for example, like disposable pens to fill out ballots. Health experts in Korea issued a report after that uh, uh, election saying there was no spike in COVID-19 infections. Several reports were issued on uh, Wisconsin where several hundred thousand people voted in person uh, one of them by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. And the Center for Disease Control report says there was no spike in COVID-19 infections. So we can vote in person. The problem with recommending to, that everybody vote by absentee ballot is simply this. The rejection rate for absentee ballots is much higher than for ballots cast in person. In fact, the New York Times eight years ago, before they jumped on the bandwagon of trying to push uh, voting by mail, in fact, wrote an a interesting article about this in which they said that the statistics showed that the rejection rate for absentee ballots was double that of ballots cast in person. The reason for that is very straightforward. If you have a problem in your, pre in your polling place, there's an election official there that you can ask questions of or who can try to remedy the problem. If you're voting by mail, there's no one in a, a voter's home to uh, uh, remedy problems or answer questions. The result of that is that uh, absentee ballots are re regularly and routinely rejected by election officials for everything from 
the voter for getting to sign the ballot, to the voter not providing all of the information they're supposed to uh, supply with an absentee ballot, to the US Postal Service not delivering the ballot on time to be counted, or for example, for getting to postmark the ballot, which will lead to rejection because states require that even if they will allow an absentee ballot to be received after election day, their laws all say that it has to be postmarked by election day. You can see this problem vividly in the primaries that were held this summer. Uh, several uh, media organizations, including the Washington Post, NPR did reports and they estimated uh, based on the vote totals that at least 600,000 absentee ballots were rejected. In New York, one in five absentee ballots were rejected. So everyone who is pushing voters to vote in person, I'm sorry, to vote by mail, is guaranteeing that well, there will be a higher disenfranchisement rate and a lot of uh, uh, voters will have their ballot uh, not count. The other big problem that's been happening, and I'll end with this and, and let the Congressman take up is, look, there are basic security protocols in place for absentee ballots to try to stop some of this fraud. Uh, states usually do a signature comparison between the absentee ballot and the signature of the voter on file. Many states have a witness signature requirement also. The lawsuits that have been filed all over the country, and we've seen more uh, this year than ever before. I mean, it's, it's really an unprecedented number. The same people pushing people to vote by mail have been asking uh, uh, mostly federal judges to void state law requirements on things like witness signatures or signature comparisons. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of judges basically jump in to interfere and change state laws when they really don't have the authority to do that. That's a very bad effect, one that could cause all kinds of, of problems. Finally, uh, many election officials, unfortunately, and courts in some cases, have ordered states to, rather than waiting for a, a voter, to fill out and complete an absentee ballot request form before they send out an absentee ballot a form which gives election officials some opportunity to authenticate the request by a signature comparison and making sure the voter provides the right registration information. Instead, they're ordering or deciding to simply mail an absentee ballot out to all registered voters. Well, the problem with that is voter rolls are in terrible shape all over the country. They are filled with uh, the names of people who have died, people who have moved away, and often, uh, duplicate registrations by the same person that have not been detected by election officials because they just aren't doing a good job of maintaining the accuracy of voter rolls. If you're vo mailing out an absentee ballot to every single registered voter, you are literally going to have thousands of ballots uh, arriving in neighborhoods all over a state for people who no longer live there or who have died. And that I can tell you is uh, our ballots that vote harvesters like the politicaros that exist in Texas will be very eager to snap up. Uh, and you know, you would hope that those would get thrown out and not used, but ballots are very valuable commodities. And there's always a the potential that someone will try to use those ballots to vote and to cheat in an election. So we have all kinds of problems. Uh, I hope we have a clean election coming up, but I'm worried about the fact that if it's a close election, we may have a lot of chaos in a lot of different places and a lot of litigation contesting the outcome. So thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. We, we appreciate that. Congressman, you're up. Sir, you're, you're muted. All right. Um, I want to thank um, the Federalist Society for inviting me to speak here today. I'm the director of the Election Protection Project with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And just by way of background, the uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute that stands for liberty, personal responsibility, free enterprise, and to promote 
those ideals in our policy, in our public policy, not just in Texas, but throughout the nation. Um, as the uh, director of the uh, Election Protection Project, uh, it is a project of the TPPF that was formed in March because the urgency was seen that in the midst of this election, in the midst of a disease that uh, was frightening a lot of Americans, that there would be problems with this election that could easily be stolen. And I associate myself with all uh, of what Hans uh, von Spakowski has just uh, expressed to you uh, as being a lot of the things that we are also involved in. We also uh, do a lot of uh, amicus briefs to uh, the Texas Supreme Court and to the federal courts of appeals on a lot of issues that are coming out of the county of Harris, which is where Houston is. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest county in all of Texas. It is um, controlled by uh, very uh, left-leaning uh, Democrats, and they are attempting to really push and cross the line from into illegality on a lot of what's going on in, in Houston. Uh, or in Harris County. One of them is that they just did a mass mailing to all of the people on their voter registration lists and sent them uh, requests for mail-in ballots. Uh, that cannot happen because requests for mail-in ballots under Texas law is something that is unique to the voter and it has to comply with certain um, legislative uh, mandates. One of them is you have to be 65 years or older or have an infirmity or a, an illness or a disability that would uh, hurt you even more if you get out of your bed or your wheelchair and get to the polls to, to vote. And also um, if you are uh, in the military, obviously, or if you are unfortunately uh, a non-convicted incarcerated individual and still has uh, the right to vote. Uh, those are the only times that it's available. And what we've been seeing uh, with our research is that many people cross off the, the little box that says they are disabled uh, when a lot of those people that asked or request in 16 and 2016 and in 2018 for a mail-in ballot uh, were under the age of 65, more so than those that are 65 and older. So there is obviously some violation of the Texas law where that is concerned. But we talk about um, what our experiences are uh, in the electoral process. I will tell you that I was born and, and raised in Laredo, which is a border town. And, and uh, in a border town, uh, the primary language is really Spanish and English is just a subset of what is spoken there. As a young lawyer in the mid uh, 70s, uh, I had my first jury trial in, in the selection of the jury. Uh, the first thing that the judge said was that you have to be able to speak uh, and write English and you have to be a citizen of the United States in order to participate in a jury. More than 60% of the veneer men that came to that court that day stood up and said that they were not citizens. Of course, it told me that a lot of these people are registered to vote and yet they are not citizens. It is a very pervasive problem down here when you see that many people, uh, even though they're not uh, citizens, are indeed registered to vote. Yet in this country, we have this mantra that you are suppressing the vote if you dare to ask anyone if they are a citizen or not a citizen. Uh, I am very thankful that uh, the state of Texas is now in the driver's license is putting a little star to the right if you are indeed a citizen. Uh, as we know that we have two ways in Texas to register to vote. One of them is through the Clintonian um, motor voter law that if you uh, register your motor vehicle or apply for a Texas driver's license, uh, the DPS or the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles is going to find out whether you're a citizen or not. And, and uh, that will register you to vote. 
But the hold in the system is that that's not the only way to register to vote. There are many operatives, political operatives that go out and register people and they have quotas uh, and sometimes they're paid for those quotas to go out there and bring in voter registrations. So what can they do in order to fill up their, their list that they need to turn in? They go out there and register anybody that's on two legs or anybody who's six feet under or people that don't really exist. And what they do is that they warehouse those names and those addresses so that when election time comes, they request a mail-in ballot. And I have seen that personally on a number of occasions. One of them was uh, in an area, uh, Anthony, right uh, there by you in, in a whole strip of, uh, of El Paso County. Uh, they had redistricted my district and they gave me a whole strip along the border there. And every door that I went to in that area, or almost every door that were on the voter registration list for El Paso County, uh, they would tell me, no, we're, we're, we're not citizens. And uh, I would ask them, well, why is your name on here? Well, every now and then they ask me, uh, you know, what my opinion is and we sign a little paper, but we're not citizens, we don't vote. But yet those people do vote. And what we tried to do within the Texas Public Policy Foundation is to try and, and put those holes or seal those holes in the Texas electoral system that is going to prevent these uh, politiqueros, or they call them sometimes cañoneros, or other names of people that go out there and harvest voters, not just mail-in ballots, but voters to come in and vote in order to turn elections. They are most effective in local elections, whether it's for county judge or county commissioner or city elections, where those votes really, really count. And those votes can really turn uh, a, a lot of instances. Here in San Antonio, just two days ago, uh, Project Veritas um, uncovered a, uh, a self-admitted vote harvester that's going out there and collecting mail-in ballots and having them signed and suggesting who they should vote for and who they shouldn't vote for. And she confessed right on there. And she happens to be the daughter of a rather famous cemetery owner that always has that cemetery voting for whoever is paying uh, for those things. Uh, those are some of the more egregious things that we have found uh, with, um, with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. But from my own personal experience, uh, we also go back to 2004, when in a Democratic primary, uh, a challenger to his uh, Democratic uh, official uh, lost by about 300 or so votes. And he filed a lawsuit that went on for uh, several weeks until finally in a bank vault in Zapata County, Texas, they found the necessary ballots that existed there. Of course, it raised a lot of questions, but nobody really wanted to go there because it is politically not right to challenge some of those things. The challenger went on to become the congressman for that district and is still the, uh, the congressman now. In 2004, I had the privilege of representing a candidate uh, for the state house. And it was predicted at that time, polls were pretty accurate that he was gonna win. Well, he lost by some 450 votes. Um, it was very strange. So we went to all these counties and looked at the mail-in ballots that were correct uh, collected from uh, senior retirement homes. And what we found is that on the face of those ballots, wh whether it was signature or non-signature or things that were missing, that we found more than 2,500 ballots that on their face were illegal and yet they were counted. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, the Texas legislature, uh, the uh, person in charge of, uh, of receiving this type of uh, complaint, because you don't go into a district court, you go into the um, legislature itself in order to challenge that type of an election. And uh, he refused to hear it. 
claiming that we had a lot of issues having to do with um, education that needed to be uh, taken care of and we needed the help of the Democrats. Um, my concern going to this is important and I would like to just have all of us remember that under the Declaration of Independence, which I contend spells out the philosophy for the Constitution of the United States, it says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving the just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, which means that through the election process, the idea that the citizenry is the sovereign and the, uh, the, those that are elected are the servants uh, uh, or the subjects of the sovereign people. And, and because of that, I firmly believe that even though, and I know that you and I, Hans, we've talked about this before, uh, but you know, the, the idea that it is the privilege of citizenship as guaranteed by the 14th Amendment and the laws of the state that established the rules and the way of, of voting, uh, that if government interferes in that right or privilege of the citizen by expanding or allowing a, a perversion of the system where non-citizens or people that are not entitled to or are going to cheat the system, then what's happening is a violation of the 14th Amendment. Now, that's my personal opinion. I think that in, in the case of um, a very recent case of Fish versus uh, Schroeder uh, out of the, uh, I think it was the 10th Circuit in Kansas, uh, skirted that issue and didn't want to even approach that issue and resolved it on the issue of, of the motor voter law. But we cannot be afraid of citizenship. And the idea that citizen, being a citizen uh, has extra constitutional rights and that extra constitutional right is the privilege of voting, the privilege of driving in a, in a vehicle or the privilege of being a citizen of that state. Uh, and it's not one of those uh, special rights that are guaranteed a protection under the constitution. It is a, it is a privilege and immunity that is being protected under the 14th Amendment. But what, what we have here right now is an all out effort uh, by politicians to try and pervert the system to advantage. And I have said consistently, why else would the Speaker of the House of Representatives and others be pushing the issue so hard for an all mail-in ballot system of, of electing our president when number one, they have no business uh, making or trying to change the laws of the individual states uh, for the election. Uh, and at the same time, they should know because they are the ones that illicitly use these perverted systems of procuring a, a fraudulent vote that, uh, that they're pushing it so hard. And on another note, we're also seeing a, a case that uh, unfortunately the Supreme Court did not rule on uh, either today or yesterday. The idea that a state or federal court can change state law during an election. And, and I know these are all very heated issues, but they're very fresh on my mind. They're very fresh on, on the issues of a lot of American people. And uh, I hope and I pray that the results of this election, even though I agree with, with Hans that it will last uh, several days beyond November 3rd, that uh, it will be clean because the American people need the security uh, and, and the comfort of knowing that whether they win or they lose, that it was a fair election and that it was done fairly and within the boundaries of the law. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, so we are at the point where we're going to kind of initiate a back and forth and go over some of the Q&A. We have, we have a fair number of questions. Before we get to them, we will somewhat indulge a panelist's privilege. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question that I believe uh, Kylie has one as well. 
Um, and this is to, to both John's and to the Congressman. Um, what do you feel is the greatest challenge we face right now in this sphere? We'll go with Hans first. And you jumped in first in the beginning. Well, I think the biggest problem is is represented by this huge push for uh, people to vote absentee. There's two things about that. Um, one, uh, I'm afraid that state officials are simply not prepared and don't have the resources to uh, handle a huge increase in an avalanche of uh, absentee ballots. And uh, the reason for that is I, I look at what happened in the state of New York during their June primary. Uh, election officials there encouraged everyone to vote by mail. They had an exponential increase in the number of voters voting by mail. Election officials in New York just weren't prepared to handle it because it takes a lot longer, more time, more resources to process absentee ballots. As a result, it took New York six weeks, six weeks to count the ballots and remember, turnout in a primary is less than that in a general election. Plus, at the end of it, they had rejected so many ballots of voters because of mistakes and not complying with state law that litigation resulted contesting the rejection of those absentee ballots. And I'm afraid of, of the, a similar problem like that happening in other states. Plus, I'm very concerned about um, someone or, or people taking advantage in the states that have changed their rules, uh, like Pennsylvania, which is one of the cases the Congressman was talking about, where the state Supreme Court there not only extended the deadline for absentee ballots, but also told election officials two things that one, they had to, they could not reject ballots as long as they're received by the deadline after election day, even if there's no postmark indicating that it was voted by election day. And then on Friday, the same court told election officials across Pennsylvania, oh, by the way, you can't compare the, you can't reject absentee ballots if the signatures don't match between the absentee ballot and the uh, voter registration file. That is an invitation that is an invitation to fraud. And I am very concerned about those kind of changes in the rules that, that make, uh, will make that easier to happen. Congressman, what do you think on that same question? Well, I, I, I hate to repeat what Hans is saying, and I, I think he's absolutely right. That, that is one of the issues that I'm most afraid of uh, in this election. And, and as a consequence, it's going to generate a huge amount of litigation uh, post November 3rd. And how long is it going to last? We don't know. And we hope that it'll be short if it does happen because there are some constitutional issues that are involved there uh, with regards to uh, when the uh, college uh, uh, of electors, electoral college meets and uh, when the elections need to be certified. So that's going to be a big mix up further, uh, confusing the American public and questioning the integrity of, of the election. But along that, those lines, I think, uh, and unrelated to, to ballots, but maybe somewhat, is the enormous amount of funds that are coming from outside the area. So for instance, in in Texas, this group uh, headed by um, the head from uh, Facebook, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, is pouring in hit enormous amount of money, not just in Texas, but in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia and in a variety of other states into Harris County, Dallas County, Bear County, Travis County, to try and influence an otherwise legitimate election. Now, you can say that I'm a hypocrite because when I was in office, I solicited money from Florida, from California, from all sorts of other places, and I got it. But when you're talking about, to this extent, people from the outside are not sending money to the campaign or the candidate, they're sending it to the government officials whose duty it is to perform these electoral uh, duties but they're being um, supported by these outside groups 
that are coming in with funds that really should be coming from the coffers of that state or that community in order to uh, move the election. I mean, in Philadelphia, I believe that they were supporting uh, drop-in boxes for mail-in ballots only in those uh, precincts that are um, heavily uh, Democrat or that would likely vote on their side. The same in Houston that has supported uh, a lot of their defense efforts in uh, the way they have crossed the line um, illegitimately with regards to Texas law. So I think that, that the influence of a lot of money, uh, partisan money, into the very roots of the electoral system that should be fair and honest and not partisan uh, is, is influencing and threatening this election. Thank you for that, Congressman. So we are, um, Kylie, did you, did you have one that you wanted to ask or do you want to go for the Q&A? And I'll, I'll go ahead and ask. Um, so this is for both speakers. Um, what are your thoughts on counting ballots received after election day that have either no postmark or um, an illegible postmark? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a big mistake uh, because it means that uh, individuals uh, can wait until after, potentially <clears throat> after the election, particularly in an area uh, uh, where ballots are being simply mailed out to all, um, all voters. It, it, it gives the potential of somebody voting after election day when preliminary results are already out. And it gives an incentive to, um, uh, frankly, campaign staffers and candidates and others to go out and solicit and find voters who uh, hadn't voted yet to try to influence them to vote in a particular way that will help them if they're trailing the election. It, it's just a recipe, I, I think, for man, uh, manipulative behavior, uh, as is some states deciding to start processing and counting ballots prior to election day. Because if you start counting ballots a week or two weeks before election day, as some states have decided to do, if that information is leaked out by a county election official to a particular campaign who, who the preliminary results show is losing, that could give them uh, unfair advantage and strategic uh, and tactical uh, uh, information that they could use to try to change the outcome of the election. So I just think that's a, a dangerous thing to do. Kylie, um, Earlier, I spoke about a case that was also reported by John Fund in a book that he published about the 2004 election and what was going on, where uh, this, in a Democratic primary, uh, this challenger candidate uh, had to go into court. And sometime later, all of a sudden, magically, these ballots appeared. Of course, these were not mail-in ballots, but what it showed was how many votes does he need in order to come over the top? And all of a sudden they appear. Um, you know, the, the, the federal government sets a day and not a week and not two days or three days, a day for voting and the election. And of course, voting is the province of each of the, of the states, but at the same time with the guidelines that it's only one day that you can do that. Counting sometimes goes on if they have voted that day, but when you have mail-in ballots that cannot be proved that they were done on the 3rd of November, they need to be thrown out. Whether, you can, whether it's illegible or no postmark at all, they cannot be counted. That's my legal opinion on that. Thank you. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go directly to the Q&A. And the first question I see is from, uh, Mr. Vandenberg in El Paso, and he says that he, he would like to know what the speakers know about non-citizen and thus ineligible election workers. Evidently, a mandamus petition was filed today in the Supreme Court of Texas compelling to compel poll watchers to review employment records in El Paso County, as county election department has refused access to pertinent employment records, and the Texas uh, Attorney General has in initiated a criminal investigation. So. Uh, the question seeks background that either of our panelists would have on that issue. 
Well, I, I, I don't have any background on that specific case, but I will tell you, for, just as a, a policy matter, I don't think that non-citizens should be allowed to work as poll workers or work in the election process. Look, it's, it's similar to this, to, to this question. If you ask people, do you think uh, someone who's not a U.S. citizen, like perhaps a Russian, <laughs> given all the Russia gets up, do you think someone who is a Russian who's in this country, uh, do you think they should be able to run for office? Well, everybody, of course, says, well, of course not. Well, then the question is, do you think that Russian, that alien, should be able to contribute, uh, uh, make a political donation to a candidate? Everybody says, well, of course not. Well, then, uh, if you ask, should those people be able to vote, those aliens be able to vote, I think most people also will say, well, no, because they're not citizens. Well, then why would you allow them to work uh, as election officials uh, who are responsible um, for ensuring the integrity and security of the election process? And the answer to that, of course, is you shouldn't. And what do you think? I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, and um, I, <laughs> Not I cannot, I can't I disagree you. with that. I will say this for for the border area, including El Paso and other areas of the border. El Paso is a community that, you know, it, you wonder whether it's Mexican or Texan or American or Arizona or California. You don't know, and because of that, you've got a lot of people from the Juarez area that work in El Paso and vice versa. So as it is in El Paso, it's in Eagle Pass and Laredo and Brownsville and in other places. And sometimes there's a lot of confusion there. But I think that it is very, very important that when we're talking about elections in an American city or an American county or an American state or country, uh, what we need to do is we need to protect the integrity of it, and it has to be run by and um, and looked after by citizens of this country that really are the ones that have a stake in this election. Thank you, Congressman. So we have a, a couple of student questions that I think unique to the student context make a lot of sense. The first is from Mike Mudro, and uh, I'll ask both and then pose them to you both. Um, can you speak to any difficulties that students at universities outside of their home state face in voting by mail? Is there anything that we can do to make legitimate mail-in ballots a more viable option for citizens generally while still maintaining election security? And then a follow-up to that question is from Jonathan Harper. He says, is it a problem that Texas has one of the lowest voter turnout rates, 51% uh, in 2016 in the country? And if so, is there a solution that doesn't involve increasing opportunities for voter fraud? So I think there's this question that balances turnout and legitimacy with mail-in ballots and opportunity. And I'd just like to see how you guys would weigh those competing values. Well, first of all, students who are uh, going to college out of state um, have every opportunity to vote by absentee ballot in a November election, because even in the states that um, require an excuse to vote by absentee ballot, uh, every one of those states uh, allows as an excuse, a legitimate excuse, if you're gonna be out of town uh, on election day. So if you, are, um, uh, if you are a student who lives in Texas, but you're going to school in, in Oklahoma, you obviously have the ability to vote by absentee ballot. What you have to be extremely careful about is that you don't take advantage of the fact that unfortunately it's very easy to register in more than one state and vote in more than one state illegally, um, to which could get you in a lot of trouble. One of the cases we recently added to our election fraud database was a student who lives in Massachusetts but is going to the University of New Hampshire. And he took advantage of that to register in both states and to vote in both states in the, in the same election. Um, one of the best things to increase the security of the absentee balloting process is to do what four states have done, uh, Kansas, uh, Alabama being two of them. They have applied their voter ID law to absentee ballots and in-person voting. And it, that may sound difficult, it's not. Um, in Kansas, there's a whole series of ways you can do that. Uh, you can either send a photocopy 
of your uh, driver's license, for example, with your absentee ballot, or if you actually have a state driver's license or a state voter ID, uh, you can simply uh, put in the serial number of that ID with your absentee ballot uh, or your absentee ballot request form. But that would make it far more difficult, for example, for someone to uh, steal a large uh, number of absentee ballot forms and then try to submit them as if they're the voter. You know, um, when I was a student at St. Louis University in 1972, um, instead of voting in Texas, I voted in Missouri. Um, I got lambasted by all of my classmates because I voted for Nixon and uh, not for the Democratic opponent, notwithstanding the fact that at that time, um, uh, Senator Eagleton was an adjunct professor at the law school where I was going and Eagleton was on the ticket, uh, although he was taken off for other reasons that he wouldn't be taken off till today. But um, we have uncovered uh, in our research that in the 2018 election, more than 18,000 voters in Oklahoma also voted in Texas. And I think that that's, that's a big issue uh, with college students uh, that are not just out of state, but uh, in one county and are registered to vote in another county and are duplicate voting or those that are from out of state. And I think that that, that can very easily be resolved with interstate pacts that uh, will trade that information uh, and make sure that they're not getting any uh, registrants in duplicate or triplicate or quadruple counties at the same time. So it, it's very important that we secure that ballot there. So the next question is directed to Hans, but uh, Congressman, I'd invite you to, to opine if, if you wish to. So the question is, um, if late arriving ballots in Pennsylvania are commingled with other mail-in ballots, will that affect whether all the late ballots might be challenged? And where do you think the Supreme Court will go on that issue? Well, unfortunately, the Supreme Court already uh, already decided that issue uh, just uh, a day or so ago. They decided not to take up the case and basically sent it back. So the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision uh, is going to stand. Um, I'm not aware that they are in any way going to segregate the absentee ballots coming in after Election Day. So. Uh, uh, I, I don't really, I don't really know how they're going to reject ballots um, when they're saying you can't reject them if there's no uh, uh, postmark on them, and also saying uh, they can't reject them if the signature doesn't match. That seems to indicate they're just going to have to count every absentee ballot that comes in, even if it strictly doesn't comply with state law. Listen, one quick point about that. The problem with what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did for all the lawyers in the audience, which I think they understand, is that, look, the, the time, place, and manner provision in the U.S. Constitution, that's the elections clause, it gives the power to set the rules for elections, not, it doesn't give it to the states, it gives it to the state legislatures. And what the problem is with what the, what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did is, they changed the rules set by the state legislature. If the state legislature wanted to pass a law extending the deadline for absentee ballot, they could do that. That's fully within their constitutional power. But in this case, the judges basically decided they were just gonna do it and they don't have the authority to do that. I, I was extremely disappointed that uh, Chief Justice Roberts actually joined with the liberal justices on the court to deny uh, issuing an emergency stay in that Pennsylvania case. And I think it was a significant mistake by the Chief Justice. Congressman, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, my thoughts are identical and in line with- uh, It's a, it's a tough act to follow. I have it's no... a tough act to follow. <laughs> yeah, I can take the other side if you want, but I'd be very, very genuine for doing that. <laughs> I don't want to put you in a position that, that we don't support, uh, especially because I can follow that up with apparently Hans has a fan because the next question is, can we get a Wikipedia editor to purge Professor Richard Hansen's smear of Hans on his, Hans on his Wikipedia page? So uh, we, 
I, I, I wish we could do that, but I, I've given up trying to fix the, the Wikipedia page is just all one long lie and misrepresentation of me and everything I, I've done. But it's just too difficult to get the Wikipedia editors to correct the information that's on there. So uh, what I would tell folks is, um, is if you read the Wikipedia page, just realize the exact opposite of everything that's being said is what's the actual truth. So what Hans is saying is that his Wikipedia page exists in bizarro world. <laughs> That's right. Kylie, go. Yeah, we actually have a, another student question, and I think that this one is really, um, is really critical at, at this point in time before the election, and I think it's also it's very forward looking. Um, so as we're we're kind of running up on our last four minutes here, um, this is from Paige Stroud, and she notes that. Um, Oh, sorry, I lost the question. <laughs> she notes that Democrats often insist that allegations of mail-in voter fraud shouldn't be taken seriously or have been debunked. Um, but how do you both expect data from the 2020 election to affect this viewpoint? Um, will voter fraud be significant enough this election that it will become impossible to deny? And do you expect any kind of policy shift with regard to future elections in response? I don't expect a policy shift because, um, frankly, they just ignore the evidence. Like I said, look, we've had thir we have th almost 1,300 proven cases in the election fraud database of the Heritage Foundation. The the left is so upset about that that about uh, two weeks ago they they published a, a hit piece at USA Today. If you can believe it, they assigned 14 reporters to go through our database. They didn't find a single inaccuracy. Their biggest criticism was that, well, some of the people that were convicted, they were really, they're really good people and so you shouldn't take it seriously. Uh, those who, who say you shouldn't take it seriously, I, I doubt the voters of the 9th Congressional District in North Carolina would agree with that assessment given that their election was overturned because of fraud. And I doubt that the uh, voters in Patterson, New Jersey would agree with that assessment because their municipal election there was just overturned because of absentee ballot fraud. Um, so it's the, the left really wants to ignore this issue. They've been doing that for years because by claiming there's no fraud, they then use that as a tactic to oppose all reform measures like voter ID or like as the congressman said, requiring proof of citizenship when you register to vote. Since they claim there's no fraud, why there's no need to take those kind of security measures and implement them. I want to add to what Hans just said, and I think that a lot of that fault comes from those in the center and the center right, that historically in the face of these facts, they come out and they cowardly say, well, it doesn't exist or we don't want to go there. Not because they've been using it, but because they are afraid of being shamed and they're walking on a very tight rope where that's concerned. Look, it, it's very, very easy to put it in these terms. Imagine that you're in a huge crowded plaza and you have your wallet in one hand and you have your cash sticking out of your back pocket. Do you think that as you exit that plaza, you're going to have your money and your wallet? You're not going to. And what mail-in ballots and the registration system, of the non-motor voter registration system presents is just that type of a scenario that is ripe for ill-doers. And that happens all the time. Look at this system that we're talking through, the internet. It was a wonderful invention when it first started, and now it's been perverted. And you've got all these people that hack it or do this or, or use it for horrible things. I get emails all the time from people that want to know my uh, credit card number or my bank account or things like that. So a very easily uh, pierced system is going to be uh, abused by people that want to use it illicitly. And it's going to happen, but it takes people with, with uh, uncowardly strength and, and resolve 
to get the issue tightened up and make sure that it doesn't happen again because there are Ill, ill-willed people that will abuse it. So we get one, one more question in and, and it's, uh, do you think that it is a plan of, of the left to push for vote by mail, knowing the high rejection rate, so they can claim the, the election is illegitimate should the president prevail? Yes. Yeah, I think that is a potential uh, uh, tactic, particularly by the political consultants um, who, are, who are pushing this, this uh, whole idea. Congressman, I think I know what you're going to say. Well, I've already said it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I, 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 we're going to close the question part with that. And, and I, we thank you, you both for coming. And um, to all the attendees in the audience, we, we've provided some links uh, to the, the, tech, the TTPF Election Protection Initiative. And I think by the end, we will have a link to the, the Heritage Foundation Interactive Database that Mr. Von Spakovsky ha has mentioned. So I, I would encourage you, there it is, I would encourage you to take a look at those to supplement the discussion that we've had today. Um, but before we close, we, I want to go into a, a few housekeeping matters. Um, for the, the, the attorneys in attendance, uh, there will be a request for CLE for this event. If you are interested, please reach out the chapter email for us and the El Paso chapter is El Paso at Gmail. Let me know if that's something you're interested in. Um, we are in the process of working on our next event, which potentially may be a debate centering on um, political censoring. Uh, I know that Seth and the UT chapter have an event that they have coming up. So Seth, why don't you tell everybody about it? You got it. Um, well, as a brief reminder, our chapter members, we do have the Fetty fight night tomorrow night um, on an introduction to originalism and a debate uh, between Elon Worman and Eric Siegel. And then on Monday, uh, I just as a plug from some of the questions that we saw tonight, there is an interest in election litigation. And next Monday, we will have a debate at noon focusing on the potential precedential value of Bush versus Gore and a summary of the election litigation in front of the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, both now and what we're likely to see right at the end of the election. So we have a couple of really timely events right here before the election. Mike has dropped the or Mike is going to drop the link uh, for that registration into the zoom chat now. Mike, you sent it to me privately. You didn't send it to the whole group. Awesome. So finally, if you if you enjoyed this evening's event, you know, we would encourage you to consider joining the Federalist Society. Membership is any national organization of which the student chapter in, at UT in Austin and the El Paso chapter are two unique ones. Um, if you have any questions about joining our information, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the National Federalist Society um, headquarters helps fund these events and assist us in bringing in speakers on interesting issues of a wide range of topics. We're always interested in hearing from you, the, the attendees, about what topics or speakers you're interested in. I noted our email address. Seth, what's your chapter email address? We can put that out there for those if they don't have it. You're muted, bud. Gosh, got me. It's been a while since that happened. Um, All right. We typically refer questions to our membership chair, and that's hjhumphreys at utexas.edu, which I think our handy dandy Mike will be able to. There it is, right there. Thank you, Mike. Outstanding. And so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to either of those emails. I'm actually going to be wise to this text thing and put mine in there for the chapter as well. I didn't introduce myself in the beginning, but my name is down here. I'm Anthony Rodriguez. I'm the president of the El Paso chapter. And we uh, thank everybody for, for joining us this evening. Um, uh, stay safe, vote on Tuesday, and um, avoid catastrophe. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.